Anti-Semitism may not be new to the United States. It is U.S. history that is being erased. But in recent years, the American consciousness has been pierced by anti-Semitic threats and violence. In 2017, the U.S. saw an unprecedented surge in anti-Semitic incidents. The same year, hundreds of neo-Nazis converged in the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia. 315, every available unit in the city needs to get here now. We're taking on 1847 fire from out the uh, front of the synagogue. The following year, a white supremacist stormed Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue in what became the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. And in 2019, six people were killed and nearly a dozen wounded in a spate of high-profile anti-Semitic attacks across the country. In this episode of Fault Lines, we examine this trending violence against Jewish Americans and the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that often inspired them. Marnie Feinberg is the founder of Two for Seder, an interfaith initiative that combats anti-Semitism and hate speech. Okay, so this is my uh, mother-in-law's wedding album. Oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously before I knew her, but she was beautiful. Two for Seder was founded in memory of Marnie's mother-in-law, Joyce Feinberg. Joyce was one of the Tree of Life congregants murdered at the synagogue that day. Yeah, these are her parents, and this is her brother. Um, and uh, he's the one that spoke at the funeral. What role did the Tree of Life Synagogue play in her life? So the Tree of Life, actually, they had been uh, members of it for at least 25 years. It was a real center of life. My father-in-law died in 2016. And uh, there's a prayer, a Jew, Jews say a prayer every day for someone that they've lost. She went for a whole year because she missed him so much. And she went every single day. And that's why we knew when the shooting happened, we knew she was there because that was part of how she took care of people at the Tree of Life. Do you know what she was doing there that day? She prayed. Multiple gunshots are heard at the Tree of Life Synagogue. On October 27, 2018, a white supremacist armed with an arsenal of weapons opened fire on the Tree of Life Synagogue. 7 one uh, suspects talking about uh, all these Jews need to die. Within 12 minutes, SWAT teams arrived at the synagogue for what became an hour-long standoff as the gunmen stalked the three congregations trapped inside. We are pinned down by gunfire. He's firing out of the front of the building with an automatic weapon. In total, the gunmen murdered 11 people, including 75-year-old Joyce Feinberg. It was a very difficult day, of course, but uh, the initial thought was is that Joyce is helping somebody and she dropped her phone or she's not allowed to touch her phone or, you know, and she got out. Of course she got out. Joyce was so good about keeping people in touch. She didn't want you to worry about anything. The idea that she would not have contacted us was impossible. So as we didn't hear from her, it, you couldn't, you couldn't escape the idea that that, that had happened. Anti-Semitic hate crimes reached a five-year high in 2016, only to be eclipsed in 2017. The attacks are becoming, unfortunately, more deadly and pretty frequent. We reached out to experts on hate groups and extremism in the U.S. We've seen a growth in, in the number of white supremacist hate groups in the United States. We have more of these people and more of these organizations than we did, say, five years ago. We have had a political situation in which the president now, President Trump, has mainstreamed extreme ideas and extreme thoughts in a way that I certainly didn't think was possible. One of the most vocal constituencies that saw Trump's election as a boon to them were people with anti-Semitic viewpoints. Their interpretation of the 2016 election was that their viewpoints had been affirmed. Over the past decade, the majority of attacks have been at the hands of right-wing assailants. And according to the New America Foundation, 
white supremacists have committed more frequent and deadly violence than any other group over the last three years. It's been one mass attack after another, after another, after another. And a lot of times the targets have specifically been facets of Jewish life, synagogues and other facilities where these attacks have been targeted. American white supremacists are best known for their history of violence against African-Americans. But in their worldview, anti-Semitism also plays a unique role. There is no white supremacy without anti-Semitism. And Jews are always portrayed as the nefarious, crafty characters who are bringing white people down. They often describe it as Jews pulling the strings of the other populations of people of color because they play this role in hate narratives that um, for those who are inculcated in those ideas, radicalized into white supremacy, and it's what makes Jews the target, right? Because if they're the masterminds destroying white power or white control over their countries, then they're the ones that need to be taken out. In the Tree of Life attack, this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory reared its head with devastating consequences. But then as the story unraveled that um, the shooter had been ginned up by all this material on the internet, I think brought to life how dangerous anti-Semitism is, what it can result in, but also that somebody could, you know, be on the internet seconds before they decide to commit this act, that there is really a connection between online radicalism and this kind of violence. As details emerged about the Tree of Life suspect, his social media revealed a string of white power references to these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. His post suggested that he targeted the synagogue because one of his congregations had hosted a service in support of immigrants and refugees. The person who committed the Tree of Life shootings was particularly enraged about a Jewish organization that was helping with refugee resettlement. And he posted repeatedly about this subject and used that as his reasoning why he needed to kill Jewish Americans. The congregation's event, the Refugee Shabbat, was part of a national project spearheaded by Hayas, a global Jewish nonprofit that aids refugees. Just before the attack, the accused shooter posted online, Hayas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. What was he talking about? Screw your optics. There's a, a debate in within white supremacist circles about optics, how you should portray, how you should look. What is the best way for you to get more people to convinced of your ideas? He was paying attention to a larger conversation taking place among white nationalists about whether violence was the correct path whether the optics of being violent was worth being violent. And so what he was saying is, no, violence is the way. I don't care about this debate about optics. I'm going in. Our social activism, which has always been part of our congregation, is a very important part of our healing process. And that's very unique to us in the community. Carolyn, Eve, and Donna are leaders of Dor Hadash, one of the Jewish congregations targeted at the Tree of Life Synagogue and the host of the Refugee Shabbat. So that takes us back to the Refugee Shabbat. We knew the address, unfortunately, from Hyas's website because we were listed as a congregation that was participating in the National Refugee Shabbat. And when I found that out, I, talk about my heart sank. It's, it's, it was incomprehensible it's still incomprehensible and it's something but, we'll carry with us for yes the rest of our but lives. doing something that you thought was a nice and totally harmless activity like leading a national refugee shabbat that it would inadvertently lead this man to the door is horrific before this um attack happened what was your engagement with or your awareness of anti-semitism and did it seem to be on the uptick recently I had been conscious of anti-Semitism. I had been in spaces where I'd seen swastikas and, you know, been concerned, but never sort of, I didn't really realize it was growing as yeah. much as it is. It's an undercurrent that is, that is bubbling up. Then internet is how people find each other in these, what I would consider fringe belief systems, and they start sharing information and they feed each other. 
anti-Semitism is itself a conspiracy theory. The idea that all of these people are all working together to hurt you. In the world of white supremacists, anti-Semitism is often coded into terms like white genocide and replacement, which stem from the conspiracy theory that Jews are trying to change the demographics of the United States. To some extent, the anti-Semitism pulls on the same old tropes, right? The Jews are somehow manipulating societies to harm white people. But the narratives that are most popular today among white supremacists revolve around the idea of white genocide. That is the great replacement theory. The idea that if there are more non-white people than white people, that constitutes a genocide against white people. I mean, what happened in Pittsburgh was an acting out of the fantasy of how you could stop white genocide. And that's not the only case. Most people will remember at Charlottesville, you know, this looked like right out of Hitler, Germany, right? With the torchlight and in the dark, we're, we're chanting Jews will not replace us. Well, what they meant by that is not that Jews are replacing white people, but that they're replacing white people with people of color in the United States. You will not replace us. Coming you will not replace us. You will not replace us. You will not replace us. In 2017, Americans watched as the Unite the Right rally unfolded in Charlottesville, Virginia. To turn on the TV that day in Charlottesville and see Confederate flags, Nazi memorabilia, racist signs, and it really did look like either a Klan rally or a Nazi rally or both at the same time. Fault Lines was there that weekend covering the story. This is a first step toward making a realization of something that Trump alluded to earlier in the campaign, which is, this is the first step toward taking America back. So it was purportedly about Confederate statues, but you, there were many people who came to that event who likely had no idea of the involvement of this statue and were coming with the intention of marching on behalf of anti-Semitic interests. Demonstrators claimed that they had traveled to Charlottesville to protest the removal of a Confederate statue, which is considered an offensive relic of American slavery. This was advertised as being an anti-Semitic rally. They made posters that involved smashing the Star of David with a hammer. The statue was a canard. Like, it, it had almost nothing to do with Unite the Right besides giving it a rallying point in a location. <laughs> The entire weekend was punctuated with violence, which came to a head when a neo-Nazi drove into a crowd, killing 32-year-old anti-racist protester, Heather Heyer. Go, 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 go. Those images, and then of course the violence that took place the, the following day, I think seared something into Americans' minds. It made them realize that white supremacy, anti-Semitism, was alive and well, and maybe thriving in the United States. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. In the wake of Charlottesville, President Trump made a series of public statements that seemed to sympathize with the white supremacist protesters. All of us had witnessed clearly a bunch of raving anti-Semitic anti lunatics for two days saying the most vile things. How could you come to that conclusion? Unite the Right, that was a real demarcation point especially for people who weren't sure what white nationalism really was or where white nationalism was going to show that this movement was a real danger and a real concern to the safety of all Americans. Last fall, we arrived in Pittsburgh just before the Jewish holidays as the community prepared for the one-year commemoration of the Tree of Life attack. If you were to speak a year ago before what happened, did you get a sense that there is a danger, there is an increase in anti-Semitism, there is something that is changing? Um, th that, that's re regretfully a very easy question to answer. It can't happen here. And I think the first reaction that everyone had was Pittsburgh. The threat is ever present. So as the high holidays are coming, what are you telling your congregations about safety? Security is paramount and you must have a ticket to get in and somebody will be in the lobby with a list to make sure that you 
are an appropriate person to come in. We have to be concerned. I will tell you that synagogues across the country are moving in that direction and it's um, nobody will be turned away from from worship um, but there will be um, there will be security screens in place. We don't want to militarize our religious life and we have to right now but we're not satisfied and we don't want to lose our welcoming open way of being Jews. In just five years, the U.S. has seen a nearly 35% increase in attacks on places of worship, as religious communities of all faiths have come under fire. There have been so many attacks on houses of worship in recent years that there's actually a fund that the Department of Homeland Security gives, to, and including to churches, to beef up security and try to harden those targets. As anti-Semitism has evolved, so have its methods and targets. According to the FBI, Anti-Semitic attacks consistently account for more than half of all religion-based hate crimes, even though Jews make up roughly 2% of the U.S. population. You know, the United States is founded on the idea of religious freedom, protecting the right to worship. And this space that we hold sacred, right, whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Christian, is now becoming a site of, of mass violence and, and that could increase, right, with the demonization of, of Jewish people that is going on right now. Bottom line is uh, October 27th, 2019 is just the first of many years where we're going to come back and, and remember this because it will be with us forever. The people we lost, we loved uh, and they were family. Stephen Cohen's congregation lost three members in the Tria Life attack. I mean, the phrase is, we all belong to a club that nobody wants to belong to. It's trite, but it's true. Uh, and every time one of these events happen, uh, they look to the preceding ones to learn. In search of answers, his congregation traveled to Mother Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina, the site of the country's last major white supremacist attack on a house of worship. We visited uh, a Reformed congregation, we visit, re visited an Orthodox congregation, and we visited Mother Emanuel Church. Mother Emanuel Church had plain clothesmen in the choir, in the pews, as well as police in uniform. And there were quite a few of them. They did it because somebody could walk in the door. There's a trending hashtag with white supremacists called uh, Hashtag every Shabbat, that that should happen every Shabbat. Do you feel safe now? Do you feel unsafe now? I have two answers to that. Do I personally feel safe? Yes. Because that's the way I've always lived. As a congregation, absolutely. We've had to take security absolutely serious. I mean, if there's one thing that I would recommend to any organization is do an active, an active uh, a shooter training. People do not know what a bullet sounds like. One of the people died because he thought it was breaking glass. One of the people survived and saved others because he recognized what a bullet sounds like. The conversation we're gonna to have today might seem scary, right? Talk about that, to think about that. Brad Orsini was the security advisor for the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, including the Tree of Life Synagogue. We all know, and I don't have to tell you all, that our community has been targeted, right? Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's been on the rise for the last couple of years, right? He now provides active shooter trainings to religious institutions across the country, like this one at a nearby Jewish school. Did, were you present at the Tree Life Synagogue that day? Yes. Had you ever seen anything like that? Never. I've been to many crime scenes in my uh, my, my career in the FBI. That one was so hard to witness because it's so personal. It's in a house of worship. It's people praying when they're the most vulnerable. By the time of the attack, the Tree of Life Synagogue already had enhanced security measures in place. Uh, we did training eight weeks prior to the shooting on September 5th. 2018, uh, we had Rabbi Jeff Myers, who never carried his cell phone prior to that, who started carrying after that. It was a conservative shul. He 
didn't carry his cell phone. He started carrying his cell phone. He uh, was the first one to call 911. What does it say that an ancient tradition like that has to be broken just so you can worship? We're in a sad state of affairs that we have to train people so they can be safe when they pray. It's a sad commentary that we have to do that. But we have to. So this, this actual uh, bag was found at one of our synagogues in December of 2018. And what had happened, the Ku Klux Klan came to town and threw about, probably about 40 of these bags in the area, uh, in Squirrel Hill and around. Um, Wait, just put that in context. You're talking six weeks after the shooting. Six weeks right after the shooting. This is a picture that was found on October 28th, the day after. Nationwide, the distribution of this kind of white supremacist propaganda hit an all-time high last year, more than doubling the previous 2018 record. You are lying, disgrace to our community, you pigs. So a family came home from a high holiday service in a neighborhood outside of Pittsburgh. So this is a porch, like someone's home? This is someone's home. Oh my God. Now, all the groups you mentioned, are, are they always here? Or were, did they come out of the woodwork because of the shooting? We've seen these posters and flyers well before Tree of Life. Okay. We hadn't seen the Ku Klux Klan here, it doesn't matter what group it is, what white supremacist group it is, they do have a common hatred of Jewish people uh, across the board. So the shooting is, is, is a call out to these kind of groups? I, I believe so. I, I believe that unfortunately Pittsburgh is somewhat the epicenter for anti-Semitism because of the attack. I mean, it's here. It's here. In Pittsburgh. It's here in Pittsburgh. And there's reason to believe it's everywhere else. I believe it's everywhere. After a shooting outside of a South Florida synagogue. Authorities say a shooting at a synagogue outside San Diego has left one person dead and multiple people injured. A gunman armed with an assault-style rifle opening fire on the final day of Passover. Last year, Americans watched as the wave of anti-Semitic violence continued, with each Jewish holiday seemingly punctuated by another attack. Five Jewish men injured when an attacker armed with a machete burst into a Hanukkah celebration Saturday. And the year ended with a flurry of attacks on Orthodox Jewish communities, a dizzying reminder of how these enduring anti-Semitic tropes also inspire attacks by perpetrators outside white supremacist circles. Being part of a visible minority and a visible religious minority that is conflated to be secretly wealthy and secretly powerful puts Orthodox Jews at real risk. According to new data from the Anti-Defamation League, the number of anti-Semitic incidents hit an all-time high last year, making 2019 the highest year of anti-Semitic activity on record. People have to understand that anti-Semitism is probably the dominant motivating force behind acts of domestic terrorism. This is the number one form of terrorism that exists within the United States. We generally feel very safe here in New Jersey and United States, but we, we can't take anything for granted. Religious liberty is at the basis of the American experiment. And the United States, for many Jewish Americans, was a bastion of relative freedom when you are fleeing pogroms and you are fleeing anti-Semitic violence of the old world. I think absolutely the ideology is, is incredibly dangerous. That increased ideology of hate speech that is increasing exponentially makes people act. It's a very precarious moment, um, I think, for the Jewish population in the United States and all around the world because scapegoating is the constant um, bane of Jewish existence, really. This thinking is on the march and rising, and the COVID crisis has made it actually worse. And for Jewish communities still reeling from anti-Semitic violence and the trauma that follows, the stakes couldn't be higher. Any person who is praying to their creator or is being spiritual and with a group, they should be the safest in their whole, I mean, that's the safest place that they should be. We have become the teacher as well as the taught. Whenever there is another one of these events, mass shootings, 
Uh, people pick up the phone and call Pittsburgh and say, what can you, how can you help us? What can you tell us? Um, and we answer the question. This is the kind of thing you don't ever get over. You just learn to live with it. We're learning. <laughs>